Good evening, and welcome to another edition of Let's Talk with Lou. Lou. Tonight, as uh, many uh, nights, is going to be an exciting recording because we've got a couple wonderful guests. Uh, this evening, I, I'm more excited than I have been for a while uh, with uh, tonight's lineup. I just want to remind each and every one of you out there that this is your show. Uh, we bring in guests uh, that uh, we think will answer some of the questions that you might have. So feel free to get on the phone and call in, and uh, let's uh, get right into this uh, matter of uh, a couple things. One is going to be a wonderful guest that I think uh, is going to be an exciting topic, and it, this uh, topic has been getting more publicity probably than anything else out there, uh, and that is Obamacare. We have got an expert, and I do mean a true expert, in Obamacare, Dr. Beth Haynes, and thank you so much for being with us this evening. Thanks for having me. Yeah, Great. Absolutely. Uh, I will give you a little bio of Dr. Haynes, and uh, she is a double-boarded family practice emergency medical professional, policy analyst, and an, on an advisory board member for Docs for Patients Care, national co-chair of Doc Squads, the founder and president of Black Ribbon Project. She's authored several publications and she was very instrumental in the most recent ruling of the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals to the Supreme Court about the constitutionality of the mandate for Obamacare. Uh, what a great, great background you have and you bring uh, to the table. So again, thank you for being here. Our other guest uh, is, I will call him, and I'll probably embarrass him, but he is the jewel of Santa Cruz County. <laughs> and I mean that wholeheartedly. Uh, this individual, awesome, awesome person. Uh, he is a former Secretary of the State of all of California, uh, certainly a, a, a long-term long resident, four-generation family member of Santa Cruz County, former State Assemblyman, for, uh, former State uh, 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 Senator, uh, and uh, his family owned uh, and he operated, and he was the editing manager for the Santa Cruz Sentinel. And thank you so much uh, with your busy schedule and being here this evening, Bruce. Thank you. It's great to be here, Lou. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Uh, again, let me uh, ask you to call in because we've got some hot topics tonight. And what, I, uh, what I'd like to do is, is, first of all, start out uh, with Bruce and uh, tell us a little bit about um, some things that you've done. I, I know some things, but I... I'm going to ask you a few questions. The things that I know are printed right off uh, a, a bio that I have, and I want to read a couple things. Uh, he was a legislator of the year uh, appointed by the, uh, awarded by the California B Board of Associations of Schools in 1999. In the year 2000, he was a California Small Business Association Legislator of the Year. He won the Leadership Award uh, for uh, being the best leader uh, in what he was doing at the time. The California League of High Schools has named him Legislator of the Year in 2001, and the California School Board Association named him uh, Outstanding Legislator of the Year as well. Uh, one thing that I picked up on your bio, Bruce, and I'm always impressed with just about everything, in fact, everything that you've done so far, um, and I didn't realize this, but you were very instrumental in protecting our natural resources here on the Central Coast by preserving the coastal properties, by uh, casting the deciding vote for the prohibition of drilling off our coast. Right. Very impressive. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to do that. <laughs> you are a fourth generation Santa Cruzan. You're a native who's been active in public activities uh, all your life. What got you interested in public service, Bruce? Well, I think um, it was family tradition. Uh, four generations of it, but uh, my father, who was very active in many, many things himself, um, uh, let me know early on that uh, we are very fortunate to have been here in this beautiful, the best place in the world to live, I think, uh, and we have an opportunity uh, to be leaders in our community. And so it's up to us uh, to make this a better community uh, than when we found it. And you, know, you do have your focus of attention of what you want to do or what you want to zero in on. And I was fortunate to be in the newspaper business for 26 years, uh, eight, eight years as city editor and 10 years as editor. 
of the Sentinel. And uh, in doing that, I was involved with the community all the time, making comments about it. I wrote thousands of editorials over the 10 years I was editor, of course. So I, I, um, I, I wanted to give back. And uh, so along with my great wife of 45 years, Mary, and I, uh, she's a former teacher, I, I focused on many things, but education probably was primary uh, in my uh, public service area, as well as when I was uh, in the legislature. So I, I really wanted, to, and environmental protection was, was critical, uh, economic uh, stability, mm -hmm. as well as just the public safety and uh, of the community. So um, we uh, established some endowments for dropout prevention uh, early on in the mid 80s. Uh, we, we also established a, a high school um, uh, assistance program so kids wouldn't have to be, wouldn't be prevented from playing in, in sports especially in these times when there's so many cutbacks. Uh, you know, and the same could be said for music or other extracurricular activities. So I, I'm, uh, I just, uh, and I've never stopped. Uh, I was in the news business for 26 years and then uh, in the uh, legislature for 11 and secretary of state for two and then retired, so to speak, uh, for the second time. Uh, but then never got away from it and uh, have now been active in the, over the last several years in Second Harvest Food Bank, uh, the Tannery Arts Center, uh, Land Trust of Santa Cruz County, United Way. Uh, the, it's, uh, it's just in the uh, Marine Exploration Center, mm -hmm. which uh, has a special thing, as you said, one of the most critical votes and one I'm as proud of any, as any is when uh, I was the deciding vote to prohibit offshore oil drilling in the state waters off the California coast. So those were all uh, good. Uh, I, I feel very fortunate uh, to have been involved in uh, community service uh, to this, that extent. There's nobody who feels better than the one who gives and is able to see it having an impact, a positive impact in the community. And I've been very fortunate to be there and been able, very fortunate to have been elected to the uh, Assembly and Senate to represent this great area. Uh, that's wonderful. Uh, I especially, uh, in talking uh, to you in the past, have, have, my attention was caught with the nonprofits that you've served on. Um, I have something that's a, a nonprofit that's certainly near and dear to my heart um, because uh, the pastor of my church got real uh, gutsy and he thought he'd break some records and he did at Twin Lakes Church. Yes, and that's right. we, we brought in more food than I think than, <laughs> than any church in the nation, I understand. That's at right. Least one of them. It uh, had the national. Uh, you know, following, and it was on every news broadcast and radio, and, and I understand that you were involved in that as well. Yes, uh, when I was chair, my wife Mary and I were, were co-chairs of it, uh, and we, we broke the record. It was two million pounds of food, and uh, then the next year, uh, others, Ryan Coonerty was a co-chair along with Annie uh, Morehauser, and they, they went and I think they got to 2.5 or something of that, you know, that magnitude. And the church itself, Twin Lakes, of which I'm a member as well, a tremendous giving church, uh, raised virtually half of that. So it was, it's tremendous. And it was a great outpouring. And you know, we have other bodies that do that too, like Gray Bears and all. They, they're to be commended. There's, uh, that's what's so uh, enjoyable about this community for me, this county, mm -hmm. is that people are caring and they're giving, and they do it over and over again. And when the times get tough, they just seem to give more or yeah. as much as they can. Yeah. And you know, and in some of the things that you see, uh, Second Harvest, which I'm the advisory board chair today, uh, some of the people who were giving to Second Harvest to others are now on the other side of it. Mm -hmm. it's, it's this five-year-long recession that we're experiencing has had a profound uh, impact on a lot of people. And mm -hmm. we just have to keep that in mind and see what we can do to make it better for everybody. And people in this county, uh, they respond time and again. And I'm, I'm just so proud to be a member of uh, you know, this Santa Cruz County Central Coast area. Wow. Um, talk about, and you, I bet you've got most of these down. I don't mean to put you on the spot, but, <laughs> I, but I do understand that there's a significant amount of folks that, uh, that simply don't get nutritional uh, meals every day. Right. And I was surprised to find this out, because we had Willie, the uh, executive director oh. on our show, and it was extremely high. I mean, uh, how, what, how, how does that happen? How do we feed such a tremendous amount of people 
through Second Harvest. And if you could talk a little bit about that, I'm excited about that. Yeah, program. it's um, in, unfortunately with this recession, it's increased uh, in the recent years. And I mean, there, there's I think a quarter at least, and I, I don't have the exact figure, mm -hmm. but it, it's been growing with this these tough uh, economic times. Sure. And you're right. And so the need is greater. And again, people have responded. But what was so great about, and I, I don't want to leave out anybody, I've just been associated directly with Second Harvest. So as, mm -hmm. I want to make sure that the Gray Bears and others who do similar services are, get the credit that they deserve as well. But just with Second Harvest, we have an agricultural community who is, which is very, very uh, beneficial for all of us, and they're very giving. And they give pre fresh produce. So half of the food that we get and deliver to those who are in Second Harvest actually are getting fresh produce. And that type of high quality of food is mm -hmm. critical in this very concerning time for me in healthcare, and you can speak, you know, the diabetes uh, outbreak that we're having throughout the nation and, and this county as well. Um, it's important that people get their, the best food ingredients that they can to live healthy lives because um, it, in more ways than one, it really is, is a draw on us in a medical area uh, and just, just a general health area itself. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what we should be providing. But that's what I really like about Second Harvest and some of these areas here that are organizations here, they really, they're looking ahead. They're, sure. they're ahead of the game and, and they're doing a phenomenal job. Wow, that's great. Uh, yeah, thank you for your service uh, on Second Harvest and, and you know, all the nonprofits that you're involved in. A tremendous job. Thank you so much. I'd like to ask another penetrating question. Um, what are some of the more significant issues and challenges uh, that you've witnessed in your lifetime in Santa Cruz County, like floods and earthquakes and things like that. Yeah, there are, there are the the natural disasters, and we've seen them all. Floods, uh, you know, in '55 and '82, and uh, uh, and then the earthquake of '89. Mm -hmm. uh, fires we've had, not to the extent that some of the other places in the state have, but mm -hmm. some significant ones. But we've been the subject of natural disasters, and every time it happens, boy, do we get a great response from the people. It, it's um, some people when somebody said boy take a disaster to really bring everybody together but this community overall is together yes. uh, there, we have different facets it's it's become a more diverse community over the years mm -hmm. like just about every place else and certainly California so uh, and how we ad adapt to that and, and you know really embrace it and say this is for the betterment of our sure. community and let's and work this out together so that has forced the issue and, and we've um, We've been, we're blessed by the best sandy beaches and the greatest redwood parks in the nation. I mean, it is, you can't beat this. It's just, uh, you can't go anywhere that is better in the world. And so we've, we've really seen that, uh, and it used to be a, a sleepy little resort town. But mm -hmm. the, really the, the, the biggest issues uh, over the years was growth control and population growth. And, as a matter of fact, one of my, my first opponent when I ran for assembly, Gary Patton, was, should be given credit for really being at the stronghold in the front line of that. And mm -hmm. some people had disagreements with how it was implemented, but to get a handle on that and take a pause was, was really a critical thing so we could assure that our natural resources were protected and that, uh, well, we, we could accommodate as best we could for the growth that was coming. But growth was the big issue. There's no question about it. And uh, for years and years, and especially in the 70s and 80s, mm -hmm. I'd say. Ah, yeah. Okay. Very good. Very good information. Uh, you know, and, and I, I think that, uh, you know, all the information you've given, you know, uh, in terms of what we've had in our past, I think you've got some ideas on uh, what the future holds for us, uh, and especially with the potential of you being a big part of that uh, in the future. Can you put, uh, you know, some language to what you'd like to see, uh, Santa, where Santa Cruz might be going and how you might implement some of those things to make some significant changes if you had what you... Right. Um, yeah, we, we have... I think we have under control of how fast we're going to grow and what we're going to do. <clears throat> and part of that, uh, people would argue, were that, well, they tried to cut some basic public services. Mm -hmm. Uh, as slow as the growth pattern is, and it is in place now, it's, it's partly due because of the, the planning uh, ordinances and restrictions that we have, but it's also because of the price of housing in this area. Mm -hmm. that, that, that limits some things, and so it's almost natural now, and it's in place, but on the other hand, growth, no matter how slow, over the years, 10, 20, 30 years, happens. And yes. When that happens, we need to assure that we have adequate basic services for the people, uh, water, 
transportation, your sewage services, and so forth. Okay. And there's big arguments in, in what we're seeing in some of those issues already uh, today when we, in water and transportation in particular. But we have to make sure that uh, we accommodate that and provide the adequate services that we're capable of doing. And I think uh, we're going to be, we've been able to do that. Uh, we probably have a little time to catch up right now. Uh, mm -hmm. But um, and when something happens like the Highway 1 expansion, that gets, it's controversial. But um, if you don't do it in a main thoroughfare like that, you mm -hmm. push it into the neighbor, the traffic into the neighborhoods. So sure. it's, because there are more people coming as, as slow as that growth pattern may be. Absolutely. Well, thank you for that uh, good mm -hmm. information. What, um, what have you seen in terms of the biggest changes here in the years that you've been at Santa Cruz? Well, the, the biggest change was in the, the 60s when University of California, Santa Cruz, was located here. There's no, no question that changed this, I think he, I said, seedy little resort town, they called it for a while. And Surfers and it. seniors. Yeah, right? but it was okay. Too. Yeah, I yeah, loved yeah. it at that time. But uh, the university came and uh, in 1965 it opened. And subsequently, uh, in 71, the, the legislation was uh, uh, approved to have 18-year-olds vote, which I think is proper. Mm -hmm. uh, those who serve should be able to vote. And basically, that was the thought. And so that, in, a, in, a, in a probably over another 10-year period, that started to really change the political makeup mm -hmm. of this, this area. And, and just the, the basic mindset uh, of the majority in this area, especially in the city of Santa Cruz proper. But uh, we, uh, UCSC, um, for, to no fault of its own, wasn't really able to deliver what they said in the initial plan in a, like a business and engineering school. So it went to, because there were those, those schools were filled up in the other branches of the UC system. So uh, it really focused on the social sciences and all. But now, uh, as, mm -hmm. as we've, developed more in the last uh, 10 years or 20 years, it's mm -hmm. gotten into the, the natural sciences. I mean, our marine sciences around here in this, this area with the Long Marine Lab and the Seymour Center, uh, so, many, so many other great things, and, and around this bay. This is one of the, the marine science research uh, headquarters of the world, and it's tens of thousands of jobs that are impacted uh, overall, and, and we've done a tremendous job with that. We've uh, also seen the impact of the, the, the uh, high technology boom from Silicon Valley. We had mm -hmm. the spill over here, and it spilled over a lot of places. But it really, it really did have an impact here. So uh, we were able to accommodate that and see it. So aside from our tourism and agriculture and our economic makeup, education and technology have become equally as significant. Because mm -hmm. in the pri public sector, UCSC is the biggest employer that we have. Yes. And, uh, and in education as a whole, one out of four people in this county, mm -hmm. uh, students, teachers, classified, are involved in education in some form or other. Mm -hmm. And so education is big here, and I think it's a real huge asset for us. And I don't want to let this go with Cabrillo College, because I think Cabrillo, that opened in 1959, has been uh, the most highly respected public institution in the county. Yes. And it, yes. it accommodates so many needs for so many people, from students to older people, and now even the, with the budget shortfalls in the mm -hmm. state, they're having to change their makeup or modus operandi. Mm -hmm. But it's Cabrillo College, I, I look at along with, uh, in particular, but along with United Way and maybe the Cultural Council, mm -hmm. those were uh, institutions that brought the county together because there's been some divisions between Santa Cruz and Watsonville or San Lorenzo Valley and Scotts Valley maybe or I, but those things, when you talk about Cabrillo or you talk about cultural arts or United Way and mm -hmm. public services, and this, this community also has been terrific in the provision of uh, health care and human care services. This county has been forward looking enough to get a combination of many, many, 50, agencies plus sure. to to create a human care alliance and where they coordinate their efforts so we get a better bang for our our government buck uh, mm -hmm. social services buck uh, it's been truly successful and uh, it's it's stretched now we, I just read this this morning I think on save our shores how yeah. strapped they are and some other nonprofits about the cutbacks and or the reduced amount of money because of the recession that is coming into some of these agencies mm -hmm. but we have the format 
that's being followed in many other places. And we're, we're to be commended. A lot of people out there are to be commended because they made this happen. And they should take a bow because yes. uh, as, as bad and as restrictive as it's become, it's still great that we have as much as we do and we're able to coordinate our efforts as well as we do in mm -hmm. this county. So I, I think it's uh, a, a real, <coughs> excuse me, a real uh, a gem that we have here, not only the people in it, but uh, our natural surroundings as well. A couple of comments, uh, in, just from my personal experience, as well as talking to some of the department heads at uh, Cabrillo in particular. We had uh, Brian King on the show. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a back to school month, and uh, he brought some wonderful statistics. It, that is the uh, hi highest rank, number one in the nation, of allied health, uh, their hygiene, their nursing program, uh, and their department of radiology. Uh, and there's a five-year waiting list. I mean, a tremendous, tremendous school that we have right, you know, within our our community. Uh, I believe it's the sixth-ranked junior college in the country academically, and the second uh, in the state, only second to one that feeds into Stanford. A uh, wonderful, you, wonderful school. You're right. And my <clears throat> my brother Fred the third has been associated with Cabrillo. He was in the first class at Cabrillo, met his wife Linda there, and they've mm -hmm. been married ever since, so to speak. Uh, well, after he went to college and all. But uh, he, um, he uh, uh, has been the, the, the president of the foundation for years on and off for forever. And it is, I think, if not the best, one of the best. Foothill is very good, but Cabrillo yes. is right at the top That's it. Yeah. Uh, of the foundations and what mm -hmm. they provide. And now what Cabrillo is doing, and, and Brian King is, well, we've had tremendous presidents there at uh, Cabrillo College through the years. But today, what they're doing now is bringing in fourth graders and to have them study and look at the campus for a day just to put in their minds, this is important and I can get here and I can go on to higher education because the value of getting a higher education can be overstated. Yeah. And just to, uh, the, the comments, that the feedback that they get, yeah. and they're to be commended for allowing this to happen, for just saying, come on, let's try this. And it's, it's uh, th this part, that program, I think it just started this year, mm -hmm. but it is a tremendous success and kids are just having a, you know, a great, uh, great time and they're, they're getting a feel for what it's like to be in a, a, a community college or college campus and it's very, very important. Yeah, yeah, wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, school that we have. And, and I will comment too, uh, in passing uh, the UCSC program, uh, in social psychology, one of the best in the country, I understand, uh, and we've got some great guys. I, in fact, this morning I was at the spa and I, I saw an old professor uh, there. Uh, great, Craig, how you doing? And he says great, and he uh, is an international expert uh, in the behavior of, um, of criminals that are in the jail system, and he gets called all over. And we've got a bunch of those, oh, yeah. several of those kinds of folks up at UCSC as well. A tremendous, tremendous group of people. If I, yeah, maybe, maybe if I could. <clears throat> about some of the challenges. One, one was uh, post Proposition 13 in 1978 that mm -hmm. shifted the funding mechanism for the public school system that kind of removed, put all the money up in the state and then they mm -hmm. came back and kind of told everybody what they had to do, mm -hmm. so to speak. And, and it, it lost a little of its uh, community of impact, I, I thought. Uh, it, it resulted in that. And you can argue Proposition 13, pro or con, but that was, that was a huge impact, too, that I, I look back on. And just the, because of the, the tax structure for public service and really primarily education. But now, mo most recently, what started with just this last fall with what they call realignment in the state, starting with the uh, public safety, where uh, non or felon, uh, non, what do you, uh, the, the felons uh, that are, are, are nonviolent, mm -hmm. they are, <clears throat> they don't, they're not sent to prison, mm -hmm. they're, they're kept in the county jails. Yes. And the impact of that we've seen, starting to see, I think we've accommodated that very well here mm -hmm. with the sheriff and our, our, our deputy sheriff's department and the police agencies throughout the county. Mm -hmm. But that's a huge, uh, a, a huge change in the operations of governmental services, uh, so to speak, as well as uh, it, it'll, it'll, it'll just going to shift more into healthcare services now, in just in the near future. Next, next sure. step, that's what it's going to be. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, we're trying to, uh, the county I think is doing a very good job of, of adjusting to that as best they can, but it's a big change. There big is, change. There's a program too that we're going to do in the future, and in fact, the reason I was talking to this professor uh, today 
uh, as I'd like him to be on the show, uh, uh, and as well as somebody from the probation department here in Santa Cruz County, as well as somebody from the DA's office, and I've communicated with them as well. We've got a pilot program that apparently is getting some national recognition yeah. about keeping criminals off the street, uh, and, and we're going to do a whole thing about that, but I think that's what you're kind of hinting towards. Well, that, that is one of them, and it's, I think it's called RAP, and uh, the probation officer, Scott McDonald, is, is yeah. been, he's been a leader in this, and where parole violations, <clears throat> uh, if you can uh, not let it happen, then you don't have to chase down the parole violator, bring him to court, it's mm -hmm. a lot of wasted well, it, it's just necessary time that you don't need to have uh, some people, these parole violators really don't know that, hey, I should have been there yesterday or mm -hmm. tomorrow or whenever. And we need, and they, they have some volunteers to call these folks and say, you know, you're supposed to, you should have been here yesterday or you're due tomorrow here. Uh, please come down and we'll come and get you. Mm -hmm. And it has cut the services and, and it doesn't make uh, a person a violator again mm -hmm. for a parole violation and so I think it's it is it's an it's a if certainly a, the a statewide model that we've they've established here and that's to their credit in Santa Cruz County but it, it is a national model too you're right yes. and uh, it's just that kind of forward thinking that really inspires me and gets me excited about what we have here in Santa Cruz County the forward-looking type of people we have and what they want to do to make our community better whether it be through the nonprofit agencies or the governmental agencies, mm -hmm. they, um, they're putting, they're getting their act together in advance, so to speak. As usual, I'm extremely impressed. Anytime I watch something, I'm flipping through and I see what's going on politically. And in fact, our, our, one of our uh, Channel 25 picks up a lot of the uh, local uh, races and things like that. And people are talking about discussion panels about you know running and what they're doing and all that stuff. You're always, you are always so well informed, and, and uh, it takes time, it takes energy. It takes uh, caring for a community like you've done, and you've had this lifetime. Your family's had a lifetime of doing that kind of stuff. And I, 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 don't don't turn red on me. But but no, <laughs> well, thank, thank you, you so, thank you so much for that, <laughs> Bruce. Thank you. Because well, you know there's no compensation in there uh, uh, for you with that, uh, other than the fact you know in terms of monetary gain. Other than you've got the best interest of our folks that are in this community at, at, at hand all the time. And, and it seems like every time I see you speak, every time I see a topic come up. You're on it, and you care about it, and it's, it's just, you're just impassioned for uh, the best that you, our community can have. Thank you for that. Well, thank you. I, and I'd, like I said, I, I, am, I am very blessed to have had this opportunity to be in a position to be able to give some time for my service. And, I, and it's extra time. I know that. And, mm -hmm. uh, but I have, I have uh, been satisfied as much as anybody else in this, that whole process. I, I love um, this this way of giving, whether it's been through the nonprofit agencies or I've been fortunate enough to be elected four times and so forth to mm. serve in that capacity and feel very good about the leadership capabilities that I've had and been able to uh, put forward, in, in especially in education, public safety, environmental protection. It's, uh, it feels good and yeah. I'm, I'm just, I, I'm really thankful to the people of this area for allowing me the opportunity to be able to do that. Yeah, and when, when I hear people talking about Bruce McPherson, you truly are, again, you're going to turn red, the jewel of Santa Cruz County. Thank you oh, for your service to that. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you so you. much. We will come back, and at the end of uh, the show, uh, we're about halfway there, um, we will talk about wrapping up, and if you can give a conclusion uh, in, in, for about two minutes at the very sure. end. And, and again, uh, uh, I think that uh, you know we've got something to look forward to in the next uh, 25 minutes, uh, and we will move to our next guest. Uh, and they are, again, completely different topics. Um, I know when first time I was on the show, and I kind of joke about this, I was talking about my to uh, topic uh, of discussion about four years ago, three and a half years ago, and I was opposite of the uh, president of the Fungus Federation, and he was a chemist. <laughs> we had totally different topics, but I asked him a couple of questions, and they were good ones, I thought. So certainly if you want to chime in for <laughs> Dr. Haynes, uh, no, feel free. Okay. <laughs> Um, it's all yours. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> We've got a, a great, again, a great uh, a bit of question and answers uh, for probably one of the most um, you know sought after people uh, information uh, things that people want to know. Uh, and I didn't say that right, but people are wanting to. Ha they have questions, um, and people go to the internet. They ask me. They call in. They go, "What do you think about that? What's going on with this?" And it's Obamacare. Um, that uh, it certainly is the hottest topic. Uh, most recently, uh, the uh, Supreme Court uh, 
upheld the fact that it is constitutional. Uh, some issues about um, the House uh, voting it down to uh, repeal it uh, day before yesterday. Certainly that's worried about the second inning of this nine inning game with that. So uh, that's probably not going to be the end of it at all. Um, but let's talk a little bit about that. Again, uh, we've talked about all your experience and I'm very pleased to have you this evening uh, on the show. And this is what you do for a living. You, you give input on this topic and a lot of other topics. Uh, being an, uh, an analyst and the kinds of things that you do, um, you're, you're very involved in every aspect of this. Uh, again, I was very impressed to see that your information was taken by the uh, 11th Circuit Court of Appeals for the most recent Supreme Court uh, ruling. Uh, and so uh, you bring a lot of Well, we had a, an amicus brief. So there was um, some research that I did about uh, what, whether or not one of the main claims in um, the ACA, which is that there's cost shifting f due to uncompensated care mm -hmm. and increasing premiums. And, and that was based on one study, which gives a bit of the data, but it was really not the whole picture. And so I did an exhaustive um, search of all the literature and came, found out that actually there isn't any cost shifting, mm -hmm. or very little. It's like 1.7% of premium increases is due to uncompensated care. So one of, the, one of the major premises of this Affordable Care Act is mm -hmm. that there's cost shifting, so it increases premiums because of uncompensated care, primarily from the uninsured, but sometimes from the under underinsured as well. And the research that I came across was saying that no, it's only about one, less than 2% of the premium increases is due to um, uncompensated care mm -hmm. being shifted on to people who are purchasing. So a, a very major premise of this law is, is, is incorrect. Mm -hmm. So our amicus brief that we put together with Docs for Patient Care and the Pacific Research Institute um, just tried to bring that issue to light, that it, there really wasn't the, the reason for that. So that was our contribution. Could you give a parallel, doctor, uh, for, uh, let's say, the uh, Affordable Care Act and, as well, uh, you know, and tie it into, like, how we used to see auto insurance? You know, there, if somebody ran into you uh, with your car and, and all of a sudden somebody didn't have insurance, then, you know, your insurance had to pick it up. Um, would you see that there's kind of a parallel with health insurance? Because, you know, I'm going There's some... a lack of, of a parallel. That's the problem. And okay. I, we stopped having real um, health insurance back in the eight, time of the Depression, mm -hmm. where the, with the beginning of the blues, it began um, as prepaid health care rather than indemnity insert insurance. And prior to that, most people paid out of pocket or they had sickness insurance. You got sick, and they were really trying to compensate you for the lost um, wages that you had. Insurers initially didn't think that you could even have insurance for health insurance. But um, the Depression, the hospitals weren't getting paid, uh, so they gathered together with some, a teacher's union and, and um, said, we'll charge you $2 a month, and if you get sick, we'll pay for your health care. So it was with the hospital, and that started as prepaid health care. They got a lot of benefits through um, nonprofit uh, exemptions and other uh, sort of legal advantages, and so this, this model of uh, prepaid health care took off, but it's been called insurance. It's not really insurance. Mm -hmm. Um, the other thing that happened was after World War II when there was the tax exemption for em employer-supplied insurance. And this is part of the reason we have the whole problems with pre-existing conditions, because insurance or your health care coverage is tied to your employer. I mean, nobody would imagine that they would get their housing through their employer mm -hmm. or, their, or their car insurance through their employer. Well, let's talk about that for a moment because uh, the, this pre-existing condition clause is certainly something that sticks in a lot of folks' craw. Uh, you buy health insurance so that you can be covered if you have a heart attack, if you have cancer, if you have diabetes, uh, and if you were to try to go to another company, they say, you've got a pre-existing health condition, you can't either get the coverage or we're going to put maybe an exclusion or a waiting period on it. Well, the whole crux of why we buy health insurance is for all our issues, right. including the pre-existing health conditions. Sure. Now, group and, that's, and, that's a pro and that's a problem with the fact that it ends up being tied to the employer. So you don't own your health insurance. Your because, employer because does. Because employers don't have pre-existing as they do waiting periods or exclusions as they do individual coverage. Now that gets really complicated because you've got different types of 
of uh, regulations, whereas the small group and the individual insurance is managed by the state. Most of the large groups, which is the bulk of where people get their health insurance, the large, is not covered by that. It's covered by this ERISA law. And then they have some specific um, regulations about accepting people as long as they've been insured then you have to accept them regardless of whether there's a pre-existing condition. So what's going to change with that? Let's talk about the pre-existing uh, Obamacare 2014. It kicks in. Give us some ideas. You're of still not going to own your own health insurance. That's still a problem. So what they've done, instead of undoing the um, incentives that drove health insurance in an in a unhelpful way, that created the pre-existing problems, all they've done is they're locking this in even further by making, you know, just reinforcing some of those poor incentives. And you still won't own your, your health insurance. It'll, you'll get it through your employer or you'll get it through an exchange with subsidies. Um, they're changing the rules. They're trying to, um, instead of allowing a, a market to come up with solutions for uh, covering pre-existing conditions, and there are some really interesting things out there available. They're just using government to say you have to do it this way and crushing any kind of innovation that the market would be able to come up with. And there's a really fascinating thing called health status insurance, which we don't see because it, we've been prevented from even having that be necessary, where you would get, you would own your own personal insurance, you'd have it from life until death, you would take it with you, it would be portable, you wouldn't have pre-existing conditions. And you could also have a little writer on that says, if I get sicker, then, then somebody comes in as a reinsurance and, and pays either the extra costs or extra premium increases. There's all sorts of really creative solutions out there that would not require the government coming in and making a one-size-fits-all cookie-cutter kind of health insurance program. I went to a meeting recently, and it was uh, advertised in our local paper, uh, and it was uh, called Medicare for All. There's a group of nurses, uh, and they come in and, uh, with a mobile unit. And they take everybody's blood pressure, uh, and they take a little blood sample, I think, for sugar, and they're kind of checking things out, and they give them an analysis. And then later on in the evening, they have a meeting about why Medicare for All might work. Now, certainly Medicare is a federal program, uh, but we're talking mostly in California. Would something like that be uh, workable? I mean, is that a solution? Would you guess it would be successful for the uninsured that we have in our state? So you're really talking about what a single payer plan, something where you know that is government um, well, run. Well, Medicare. Is yeah, Medicare. Everybody's got once you're 65, if you've paid in your 40 quarters, uh, and, and you've got Part A, which is you know free for the most part because you paid for it, which is hospitalization. Medicare Part B is the uh, about a hundred bucks a month. It's a, it's a bargain for the buck. Uh, and, uh, to this, who? <laughs> <laughs> well, to the individual paying it, but, you know, right. in terms of cost. Uh, but these are folks that are over 65. Uh, would something like that work, uh, would you guess, uh, Dr. Haynes, if they were able to, those uninsured, uh, able to buy into something like that under age 65, would you guess it would be workable for those people or, or not? What, what, what's your take on that? Well, it depends on what you, what you mean by workable. I mean, the, it just like I think with the current health care law, there will be certain people who will be winners. It's created winners. Mm -hmm. People who, um, the, some of the winners are children up to age of 26 and parents who now can keep them on their health, health yep. insurance. The losers are the fact that it's going to drive everybody's premium costs up. So um, a Medicare for all might create some winners. But just like Medicare itself, every time the government subsidizes, gives away free health care, and there's really no such thing as free, somebody has to pick up the tab. So you're, you're creating more winners and losers. And um, the question is whether that's an appropriate thing for the government to be doing, is picking and choosing who's going to be the winners and who's going to be the losers. So a Medicare for all doesn't solve the problem of affordability. It just shifts the cost of who's going to be paying for it. I see. And I think that's part of the problem with the Affordable Care Act. It's shifting. It's instead of having um, people be able to have actuarially appropriate um, insurance, you're making the young and the healthy pay more so the sick and the older will pay less. Sure. You know, it's just that, so you're not making it more affordable. And in fact, what's going to happen is the same problem that happened with Medicare. Medicare worked great when nobody was worrying about what the costs were. Because initially they said, we'll just have um, customary, you know, doctors can charge their usual and customary charges. And we'll supplement, um, we'll subsidize 
health care for um, people over 65, demand skyrocketed, mm. you know, way beyond the supply. Prices go up. It makes it less affordable for other people. Now you need more people to be subsidized. And you get into this cycle of the more the government subsidizes, the more demand there is. And, and the person who's using this, the services doesn't have to consider the cost, and that includes for physicians. Mm -hmm. So the only reason Medicare has worked as well as it has to this point is because we've been putting it onto the, um, the shoulders of the people who are coming afterwards. It's been you know, further and further debt. It's mm -hmm. really not solved the problem of affordability. It's just increased debt. Eventually, we've got to write a check for all that debt. Absolutely. Can you, can you imagine you and I or any of our personal affairs being run like that's run? It's, it's tough. It's, you know, it's a challenge. Uh, and, and certainly uh, that, that will be something that will come up for a lot of years to come if it's not nipped in the bud now, I, I think. Uh, and so we do have uh, some challenges there. Um, if Obamacare goes through in the state that it's uh, been proposed to go through, uh, uh, Dr. Haynes, how would you think that the doctor-patient relationship would uh, be affected? I'm, I'm really concerned about what happens with it. And that fact, that's what got me involved with this when they first passed the law. Um, just even on that Christmas Eve when they passed it through the Senate before it became law, it was still a bill. Um, I feel like the doctor-patient relationship was not part of, of the conversation. What this does is it increases the amount of involvement of government into the relationship of a doctor and patient. Somebody has to make decisions mm -hmm. about who, how much money is going to be spent and what is going to be spent on. This shifts much more of the power and that decision-making occurs centrally in the federal government. It takes it out of the hands of the individual patient and, and the physician. There's, people don't even know what health care costs. They can't make decent uh, decisions about, is this really worth it to make that? Because they're not being faced with the true costs of it. I mean, and that's part of the whole point of this, is people feel like people shouldn't have to care about the health care costs. You have to care about the health care costs. And if you aren't personally making those decisions with you and your doctor advising you, is this, is this worth it, you know, the expense to, for a treatment? Um, is this particular surgery the best way to go? If you don't make those decisions, somebody has to because resources are not unlimited. Mm -hmm. And it's just going to be shifted further and further away from the doctor and the patient. And they're going to have to be a bureaucrat, right, sitting there in there writing the regulations about what the treatments can be. Sure, sure. Very limited, it sounds like. Sounds like there's going to be more involvement uh, with the folks that maybe should be less involved uh, with the care that we receive uh, as seniors and uh, middle-aged folks. The other thing I'm seeing is there's so many regulations about how to run a practice. Mm -hmm. and so the small practices or solo practices are being driven out of business. Sure. A friend of mine is a um, pra family practitioner in Florida. And four years ago, there were 12 primary care physicians in his small town, two of whom were employees and the other 10 were private small businesses. Mm -hmm. That's completely reversed. He and his partner are the only two um, independent physicians. All the rest have sold their, their practices to large hospitals because the requirements for this electronic medical records, the amount of reporting that they're having to do, all this is driving up costs. And it's, and, and it's intentional if you look at the people who supported this. They don't want independent mind individual physicians. They want them all herded into groups where they can control them, tell them how to practice, even though there isn't any proof that all these quality um, measures that they're requiring the physicians to um, monitor for and plug into the medical records. There's absolutely no evidence that any of this creates higher quality care. So there's not a model out there uh, that, that, let's say, that we're attempting to duplicate with what we're trying to do? There have been a lot of demonstrations that Medicare has done. Mm -hmm. And most of them have not showed any cost savings or any measure, significantly measurable increase in quality of care. That is interesting. Uh, uh, let me. T we have a phone call, uh, and let's go to our caller. Uh, yes, uh, are you? Did you make it through? Hello. Hello. Yes. Yes. My question is: Are we going to need a totally new bureaucracy uh, to to go between Obamacare, Medicare, and Medicare? Uh, I know the, fed, the federal government has a whole and a whole bureaucracy. Is California going to have to do the same thing as well as every other state? Do you understand the question? So you're asking. Well, so the 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 federal government creates um, a large bureaucracy with the CMS, which is what runs Medicare and Medicaid. Mm -hmm. 
and then in the what's happening in each of the states is there have been uh, as part of this health care law is to create the health care insurance exchanges and that is also being directed by the secretary of health and human services so that is the huge bureaucracy that's going to be coming from the the feds now that supposedly the states can design their own um, health exchanges but it really is still the secretary of health and human services who gets to define what the insurance must consist of mm -hmm. and has the final say about how these insurance exchanges are going to be formed and so forth so it's, it sounds like uh, it's similar. Medi-Cal is very similar to uh, that, the kind of model that you're talking about in a sense because we have Medicaid, which is the federal program for low income, and then we, uh, you, we have Medi-Cal here in well, California. Med yeah, Medi-Cal is California's mm -hmm. Medicaid. Hmm. So that's how you would see this working. In fact, if it did work uh, or did go through with Obamacare, that the, the, the human health, health and human services. Uh, well, right now, would... California is is in the process of setting up the. It's one of the states that is mm -hmm. forming this health um, insurance exchange. It's supposed to be. They call it a marketplace, but it's so government controlled. I don't see how you. I mean, that's not a yeah. fair use of the word marketplace. But it'll be a place where insurance um, will be offered and people can purchase their insurance. It's the only place for low income and moder moderate income people to be able to get subsidies is through this. They will also, you know, you go in and say, I, I would like insurance, and they'll look at your in income. You have to report your income on a monthly basis to mm -hmm. see what your subsidies are. Um, if your income goes up, then you have to pay some of that back in the future. If you qualify for Medi-Cal, you have to be put on Medi-Cal. You cannot say, no, I'm going to skimp and save. I don't want to go on Medi-Cal. I want to use whatever meager resources I have to be able to purchase yes. um, private health insurance. You're not allowed to. They will not give you subsidy. If you qualify for Medi-Cal, you have to go into Medi-Cal through wow. the exchanges. We've got another caller. Uh, Patrick uh, has just called in. Patrick, did, did you make it through? Thank you very much. Yeah, I wanted to ask the doctor uh, to if she could explain the, the two-tier system that will, that will uh, happen after Obamacare goes into place, such as those with a lot of money will be able to have the uh, medical care that they, that, uh, they want, where the masses will be under Obamacare and will be subject to uh, uh, subject to the ability to provide a service. You know, do you understand what I'm saying? Uh, I'm not sure because everybody's under Obamacare. Well, and um, what, I, what I've heard is the doctors, a lot of surgeons and physicians, are choosing to get out of that and go into private practice to where they will only be servicing those that can afford their services. And the, the, remaining, the remaining physicians or practitioners will then be part of Obamacare. So, so there is a concern with the fact that Medicaid and it severely underpays um, physicians. Most physicians find it cheaper to just treat patients rather than actually go through all the billing with Medi-Cal. Um, Medicare right now, if all the uh, cuts and controls go through, is um, slated to be right along with Medi-Cal as far as that low. Medicare and Medi-Cal Medi are going to be? Medi-Cal. Okay. It, it won't happen because okay. they always rescue it at yeah. the last minute. But then that throws their budget way off, right? They say right now that yeah. if you look at the way it's scored, um, the ACA is supposed to actually save the debt. Yeah. But that's assuming that all those cuts go in. They never have all go in. Yeah. And if they do go in, then Medicare ends up paying physicians and hospitals the same rates as Medi-Cal. It's very, very difficult for people to get a physician um, to take them because Medi-Cal pays so, so little and Medicare is headed in that direction. So the two-tier system is that if you are um, continuing to cut back what you're paying physicians, and physicians don't get to set their rates most of the time. Mm -hmm. They're set by insurance companies, mm -hmm. that's set, and, and a lot of times that's pegged to the, what Medicare rates are, a certain percentage of Medicare. There are a number of physicians who are, are opting out of Medicare, who are going for a cash basis, but, but that will not solve the problem of catastrophic problems. I mean, physicians can do primary care and office care through cash practice, but 
um, what happens if you need chemotherapy for a devastating cancer? Yeah. You still need to have insurance. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not sure that there'll be this two-tier. There will be the, the option to pay uh, cash only pay uh, physicians more mm -hmm. so that they're willing to sit and talk to you for an hour rather than the 15 minutes. I mean, you know, a, a Medicare uh, physician seeing a Medicare patient will get paid the same if he talks to you for 10 minutes, if he talks to you for an hour. There's no way to compete on price, so there's no way to p compete on quality. That's what part of the problem that we have. And, and again, I think this law aggravates it. So you can't really escape that need for some kind of insurance with catastrophic care. Part of the problem with the ACA is it will outlaw the ability of someone like myself mm -hmm. to continue with just catastrophic care and pay for those out-of-pocket um, predictable costs myself. So, it, you know, that system of what you were trying to compare it to auto insurance or homeowner insurance, sure. we don't pay for our lawn maintenance, we don't pay for our oil changes yeah. using um, our insurance for homes or for autos. But we do ac expect our health insurance uh -huh. to cover those very predictable smaller, uh, which should be out of pocket. That drives the costs up. And anything that drives the costs up makes it less affordable, causes that whole problem with the uninsured. Wow. If you could summarize uh, where you think this thing is going uh, in, in a short period of time, we've got uh, a few more minutes, and then I'm going ha to come back, and, and then each of us get to kind of uh, do our little uh, summary about uh, what we've been talking about, including myself, about the show. Uh, but talk to me a little bit about, in our listening audience, how Obamacare, if in fact it goes through bottom line in a minute or less, will affect our community uh, either positively or negatively. Got a minute. <laughs> <laughs> well, everybody, it, it, it is going through. I mean, the, it's law. It's the law of the land. Mm -hmm. And um, only the elections will change that. Mm -hmm. Okay? Um, the way it will affect positively is that there will be some people who will gain from it. There are some winners in this. Um, there are also a lot of losers. And, and mostly the losers are the fact that it is not going to solve the problem of soaring cost of health care. It does nothing to do that. It does everything to aggravate it. Yeah. So in the long run, it's going to create more people who need to have subsidies, more people who can't afford the health care. So it's, just, it's driving the, the problem in the wrong direction. What can our listening audience do to make a change, if any, would you get? I think we need to have a, a, in place a repeal-capable president and Congress mm -hmm. by November. Because I think this, it's, this is just not good. Although it solves some problems, it creates many, many more problems, and it's, and it's pushing... This law is pushing health care in the wrong direction. It's not going to increase quality. It's not going to increase affordability um, or access. And so we need to get rid of it and put something better in place. Ah, thank you so much. We're going to come back, and I want to talk a little bit about a couple minutes. Each person, and Bruce, if you can come back uh, for another about two minutes, and we've got <laughs> six left, uh, and talk about a summary. Uh, about uh, what we've talked about the last 30 minutes. Well, the last 30 minutes is uh, it's complicated, and uh, and it's hard to get it right. And, and maybe uh, maybe that's what um, I'd like to say. Change is hard, and it's seldom perfect. If if we're talking about government, and we just have to be transparent in whatever we do. Mm -hmm. I think that's one of the problems with what happened with Obamacare, that we, it just wasn't as transparent as I would have liked. I mean, it seemed to me like maybe you should fix Medicare or approve it or something. But, but I, to get back to our own county, yes. um, change, is, change is coming. Uh, I don't know what exactly it's going to be, but one of the big things is the, the elimination of redevelopment. And already there's some uh, substitutions that are uh, for these infrastructure banks or something like that that the state legislature is thinking about. So even though we've, we've lost redevelopment and a real revenue source for local governments, mm -hmm. there's probably something in the, the not-too-distant future that's going to be available. Uh, it could be. Uh, we just need to adjust as best we can, but we, what is really needed to is for us to get our act together and discuss these things and open be transparent, uh, transparent, and really have the leadership to say this is what's going to be the best for us, and discuss the different parameters and what are the opportunities. Once we do that, uh, we can make our own choices, and we can make them well because we have in this county for years and years, and we'll do it again. I will say you have a, you have had, had a wonderful, wonderful 
uh, reputation of doing exactly what you're talking about. Uh, you're preaching to the choir. You do. You have been uh, very transparent in all the things that you've done in the past with a lot of following, a lot of good things that have happened and come out of what you've done and how you've accomplished those. Uh, and again, I, you know, I, I, I repeat myself, uh, but, but thank you for what you've done. And I hear that in the future you would like to continue to do and have the successes that you've had uh, in our community. Uh, and uh, if that happens for you, I, I, I for one am going to be very pleased and I think there's going to be a whole lot of folks out there that are going to be in the same boat with having you in leadership. So uh, thank you for that. Bruce. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to serve. Thank you so much for, for being here and, and serving. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Haynes, if you can summarize, now we've uh, we got about four minutes, so we'll give you a couple minutes if you can summarize, <laughs> and then I get the last two minutes. <laughs> I, I think my summary would be is we have not had a free market in, in health care for over 100 years. Mm -hmm. We've had a mixture of government control, government subsidies, and freedom. And I think that the people who have supported um, the, the Affordable Care Act have blamed the market on causing the problems and therefore have created a system which is much more government as a solution. Mm -hmm. And I think that's exactly the wrong direction. I think it takes away freedom of choice from patients. It takes away the ability for um, healthcare innovators to create more. We are not, we are not going to cut and, and cost control our way out of this problem. We need to be able to innovate, mm -hmm. to have, um, like in the high-tech industry, things don't cost more now because of, of the high-tech. They cost mm -hmm. less, and we need to have that free competition, the innovation, the creativity to, to have healthcare prosper and grow mm -hmm. and okay. grow our way out of this problem. Okay, very good. Thank you, doctor, for being here. Uh, we surely appreciate your expertise, and, and uh, you've just b brought a lot of information to our small little community. Thank you so much for that. Uh, and again, for both of you, wonderful guests this evening. I would like to say in the last minute or so, uh, again, Let's Talk is your show. Uh, it's, uh, it's a show that uh, likes, we service you in terms of questions and answers. We go on once a month, uh, and it's the second Thursday of every month, and then it plays anywhere between 15 and 20 hours during that month that we broadcast it. And again, I encourage you to call in, and if you'd like to email me and let me know what you would like to talk about, I will attempt to get the kind of people that you want, such as Bruce and such as Dr. Haynes, on the show to talk about some of the hottest topics. Uh, again, feel free to call in, email me, call me. I am available, and thank you so much again uh, for just listening in to our show. Uh, again, come in with uh, your questions. We'd love to have you. Thank you so much for uh, being here this evening with us. Thank you.